Be back here in. Okay. Just start. Just start, yeah. Go ahead. Just start. Uh, I cut into the middle of your jingle or into that intro, so we're this is live now. We're totally. <laughs> All right, we're back and we are live. Welcome back to the Urban Monk. Uh, I am back in studio. We're trying to get our wiggles out. We had a bunch of uh, uh, pre-recorded uh, shows that we were working through, and now we're in our new iteration, which is essentially here we go. We're live. I get to share my guests with you, and uh, we get to hang out here on Facebook and do it. So it's good to be here. Uh, we'll do uh, a series of shows this next few weeks, and then we'll you know tuck in for the holidays a little bit. And this is how we're going to roll in 2017. So uh, my guest today, former pro juggler uh, who was on stage juggling with Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones, Fifth Don and Aikido, uh, super interesting guy, um, and you know is into the stuff I'm into, so I'm partial to uh, you know the, the the work that he's done. Um, author of a book. Uh, uh, talk about the seven things Leonardo da Vinci can teach you about creativity. Michael Gelb, uh, I'm excited to talk to him because this is a time uh, right now, the time we're sitting in, where there's all this constraint on all of us. There's so much like uh, challenge and stress uh, culturally and you know the political climate and all that. And I think it's time to unpack a little bit of our creativity and get into our humanity and have some fun today. So Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Grazie mille. Oh man, so you uh, you juggle a lot of things more than just batons. I mean, you've been you've been uh, a student of life for a while. Uh, you have uh, been doing keynotes and a lot of the conscious capital movement stuff. That's how we met. Is you know, as I'm making this movie about conscious capitalism, uh, you were highly recommended as an individual to talk with and consult with and I just loved your story. I said, hey, you know what, the movie's going to take a while to come out. Let's uh, let's hang out on the show. So give us a little bit of your background, if you will. Well, I got to tell you about a really poignant, intense moment that happened earlier today. I'm writing this new book. It's called The Art of Connection. It's about the seven relationship building skills that leaders really need now. And one thing I love about writing a book is it's a great opportunity to dive into a subject to really learn something. I mean, I, to me, the writing process is also a process of inquiry. Like I, I've been teaching the art of connection. I've been teaching creativity for many years. I have seminars on it. But I don't just take for granted everything I've been teaching. I'm really thinking about it. I'm deeply meditating on it. So. What I do almost every day when I start writing is I pretty much read the whole thing just to see how it's hanging together, to see how I can improve it, to see how what I've learned in thinking about what I'm writing about may have changed what I wrote yesterday or last month or six months ago. So there's one line that I, I wrote. I have a chapter on resolving conflict, and obviously I take an Aikido kind of approach as learn to understand who you're having a conflict with and what are the underlying, the fundamental feelings and needs of the other sides. Because uh, you know, one of the classic principles of conflict resolution is, first of all, don't make it worse. And another principle is look to the fundamental feelings and needs that are involved in causing the conflict rather than people's positions. Try to get to the depth of it. Anyway, I have a whole chapter about this. I've been teaching this for years. And in this chapter, I, taught, I, I wrote, when I first started this, I wrote it in this chapter, something to the effect about how I was motivated to study this and begin my exploration of this because when I was a teenager, the world, these are the words I actually wrote, the world seemed divided into two opposing camps. And there was a sense of tension and conflict and anger and fear dominating the landscape. And I thought to myself, there has to be a better way. We've got to learn to think more creatively. We've got to take a more creative approach to our differences than I saw people taking around me at that time. And then I'm reading that. I said, like, whoa, here we are again. <laughs> Jeez. So it's this is this is you know it's a universal truth, but wow, it's really the time to think 
deeply about how we can be more creative in the way we approach differences and difficulties. Yeah, and especially nowadays, I mean, listen, there's so much polarity, there's so much duality out there, and you're a student of Taoism, we've talked about this offline. Um, and, you know, coming from a, a position of duality, you're always going to maintain duality. And so, you know, it's either our argument or their argument, and, you know, we're right, they must be wrong, or, you know, obviously, if you supported so-and-so, then you're part of this gestalt. And so, how does one take a unifying creative uh, stance on this to rise above this kind of polarity consciousness and really start to go into a place where we can creatively look at solutions that are, that are, that are for all of us? Well, you know, that, the first principle for thinking like Leonardo da Vinci is curiosita, curiosity. It's, it's the driver of all creativity, improvement, and change. And you just frame the question so beautifully. It is to contemplate that question, hold that question with you uh, uh, every single day. It is that question of how do I find that unity? How do I find that oneness? How do I find peace within myself first? And then it, it does, I, I, I'll give one piece of, of practical advice is just don't make anything worse for starters. Uh, don't make anything worse. And then hold that question, the one that you just posed, how can I find that oneness within myself? And of course, then there's lots of good guidance on how to do that. You know, you, part of what you and I are, are aligned in is we're, we're doing everything we can to try to give people resources to, to find that sense of connectedness whether it's looking after your health and wellness, whether it's being mindful in your diet, whether it's making sure to exercise, all of the principles of self-care become that much more important when you're under stress. And for many people, this is a very stressful time. Yes, it is. It really is. But so now I'm curious. And so Leonardo is walking me down this path here. And we're, so we're taking the Da Vinci, the Da Vinci alchemical path to yep. op uh, opening up my creativity in this. And then we sit with this. We think about how, where our position in this is. We think about, you know, what where maybe the, uh, the contrarian position of this would be. What would be the next step? Well, it's, <laughs> I'm telling you. Now, I don't know if you just read everything I've written and you've integrated it and you're perfectly guiding these questions to make an ideal flow from one principle to the next. <laughs> but the next one is dimostrazione, which is the term Leonardo actually used to his students that said, when he said, you must learn to think for yourself. And wow, is that important now? because so much thinking is now pre-digested. People are being inflamed one way or the other. And the sense of, of really being able to contemplate disparate points of view and look for what underlies them and what you, what's your real thinking. You know, uh, George Bernard Shaw said, people hate thinking. They'll do almost anything to avoid it. He said, I've made an international reputation for myself by doing it once or twice a week. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so find, find intelligent representations of points of view that may not be your own and listen with an open mind before you say you've really thought things through. Because most people aren't thinking, they're just doing what William James called rearranging their prejudices. Mm. That seems to be one of the bigger challenges, um, you know, with our contemporary issue that we're sitting here with is, you know, a lot of news is coming out now talking about the flavor of media and how, you know, depending on what camp you were in, the information you got and your Facebook friends, everything was kind of shared within the same gestalt. And so, you know, this is, this is what they're doing and this is how we feel. And so it's become this kind of uh, battle for the minds of men and women in a way where it's been kind of, you know, as Alex Jones calls it this, but information wars, right? And so it's really the question of, you know, where you're getting your information and who you believe versus thinking on your own which is 
it's challenging. It's hard. It's hard to even know facts. Like I, I saw something today. They're like, oh well, no, Trump won the popular vote. Well, what what's the answer, <laughs> right? Like where is that answer? Yeah, and you know, it's 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 weird because like in Leonardo's time, there wasn't enough information. Mm. Now there's too much, uh, and and either way, the challenge is demonstration. Really demonstrate it for yourself. Think it through for yourself. If you're just talking to people who only agree with you, uh, you may not be getting the whole picture. Yeah, and there's so much energy behind it now that there the vitriol has has kind of booted up where it's almost like, you know, it, it's this must be how people felt during the Civil War too. It's just you know it, it gets so heightened that uh, at a certain point, it doesn't matter. As soon as someone is dissenting with your opinion, then they're obviously, they're, they're a lunatic and they're wrong and they're you know, either against the establishment or you know, one way or the other. And so it's hard to have a conversation, let alone independent thinking, that, that you know, if it's crowded out there. And so we slow down, we learn to think for ourselves after we've been curious and we've sat with this, and so then, where does Leonardo take us from here? He takes us to the third principle of sensazione, sharpening your senses. The popular term for this today is mindfulness. But Leonardo wrote about it 500 years ago. He said, 500, it's amazing, 500 years ago in Tuscany, Leonardo said that the senses are the ministers of the soul. But he also said that the average person looks without seeing, hears without listening, touches without feeling, breathes in without awareness of aroma or fragrance, eats without tasting, and talks without thinking. <laughs> so. Yeah, hey, I met that so, guy. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> right? So. We need to model the kind of consciousness we would like the world around us to have. And paradoxically, in a time where there's so much ugliness being spread around, it's a really important time to remind yourself of what's beautiful. I don't know if you saw the super moon last night. I went out and did a little super moon meditation. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, savoring the joy of living, even in the midst of difficulty. As a matter of fact, especially in the midst of difficulty. Uh, seeing the beauty in the people in your life, your partner, your children. Looking for that soulful quality in the people that you meet. Looking beneath the surface. This has always been, going back to, the, to Plato, one of the great secrets of artists is, is the artistic way of living, is to look for beauty in the face of difficulty. This, Leonardo would tell us, this is a time where art and the artistic consciousness is more important than ever before. Amen. Amen. Well, and it's also a rally cry back to our essential selves. I mean, really, we're in a position now, it's like, you know, if, if you've been in, a, in the delusion that someone outside is going to fix your problems for you, it's probably a good time to have a wake-up call. You know, there, there's a sense of agency that I think has been taken out. You know, healthcare, forget about it. You know, you just go to the doctor and they'll fix it. And that's become like a, a resource and an energy suck. The banking sector and all these different kind of uh, top-down institutions that have really grown to become corrupted and, and, and you know, are creating our global challenges uh, and our, you know, and our American challenges to, uh, to be very specific. These are all places where we've given up agency, in my opinion, and we have lost our, our sense of individuality and our sense of um, personal power. And so sharpening your senses, uh, you know, it seems that the entire media gestalt is all about letting that go, right? I'm, I'm here to be entertained. I'm here to forget. I'm here to, you know, just have a good time. And that's the opposite of what 
the great men and women of antiquity were teaching and to this day. I mean, if you want to be present, you will be a player. If you're not going to be present, then you're just going to be told where to go and how to vote and where to, where to spend your money. Amen, brother. Yeah, man. So listen, I think that, you know, my listener base in particular is very, very um, interested in seeing a better world. And so what I'd want to do is help judo flip whatever energy is out there right now into what the great master Leonardo would have given us as advice. So I love the fact that you are his agent here, you know, standing, standing, uh, standing in your time machine and, and helping us with this. And so what, what, what would be, after sharpening the senses, what would be yes, the next principle? Yes, the next one is, it's a, it's a beautiful word that was coined by art critics to refer to the hazy, mysterious quality in Leonardo's paintings. The word is, in Italian, is sfumato, sfumato. And what it means is going up in smoke. It, it refers to a core principle of the creative which is the ability to maintain a sense of perspective in the face of the unknown. And people's sense of certainty of the order of things has been dramatically upended. It's a time of, it's actually always a time of uncertainty. We have an illusion that we can count on uh, yesterday being, uh, tomorrow being like today and so on, but wild dramatic change uh, can happen at any time to any of us uh, without any warning. Uh, my clients who work in organizations have, some of them have been waiting for things to settle down over the last 30 or 40 years, and of course that hasn't happened. Uh, the people who've done the best, as who I've mentored over the years, are those who have what you call that sense of agency. They don't think that they have a job. They think of themselves as entrepreneurs, even if they happen to have a position in a big company. Uh, it's that sense of taking your own power, your own creative power. That's what Leonardo is calling us to do. And you got to do it most especially when things feel chaotic and uncertain. You know, if you think about the Mona Lisa, the most famous work of art in human history, what is she smiling about? Mm. Well, she sees the flux, that there's constant change, and yet maintains this this little sense of smile, which tells us she has some perspective. And you know, it amazes me, we talked about Taoism earlier. One of the most ancient and simple Taoist practices is the inner smile. And when, and you can, I mean, I want people to try it right now. I mean, sit, sit like Mona Lisa. Uh, upright, poised, and then imitate her famous smile. I did this uh, exercise with a group of gifted children, ages eight to 11. And the kids were so into it, you should see how intense they were sitting there smiling like Mona Lisa. And then one of them says, she's got a secret. <laughs> and, and another one says, yeah, she knows that everything has an opposite. And the kids start saying opposites, like boys and girls, day and night, good and bad, life and death. I asked my average corporate group, I said, what is she smiling about? A while ago, somebody said, I read in the Wall Street Journal that the famous <laughs> smile was caused by a dental problem. <laughs> <laughs> Mona is like the, the Western equivalent of the ancient symbol of yin and yang. Hmm. And we need to find, I mean, it's a time to find one's center, to find the core, to breathe in, literally, to your own central axis. I mean, here's the you know, practical exercise people can do right now, is align around your vertical axis, soften your eyes, soften your jaw, have that little Mona Lisa smile, 
and breathe into that central axis. Breathe all the way into your belly. Let your lower belly expand. Let your lower ribs expand, your lower back. Keep your little smile. Keep your eyes soft. So if you want to be centered, breathe into your, to your center and remember to refresh that inner smile. Then, then you can access your creative thinking. That brings us to the next principle, which is arte scienza, balance art and science, logic and imagination. So think, you know, one of the things that's missing is logic, reason, analysis. Think things through. I mean, it's not a time of great rationality. It's a time of crazed emotionality. So access reason, access logic. Avoid jumping to conclusions. And then, yes, you your intuition and trust your gut. But you're not really, if you haven't analyzed things, if you haven't gone and practiced dimostrazione to really think things through and get data from different sources and constantly be seeking out reliable sources and checking your sources. I mean, the, you know, the internet's an incredible blessing. You can get unbelievable wisdom from all over the world and the great masters of every tradition and the best music and every kind of resource. But the default setting is vile rubbish. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the onion had a headline a while ago already. It said lowest common denominator plummets. <laughs> so, so you've got to be vigilant and really focused on, on getting to deeper truth in the midst of all all the garbage. Uh, uh, and you know, right now I'm, I'm writing this book, so I'm doing a lot of research. And yeah, I'm doing a lot of it on the internet, but I actually am checking to get to the real source of, for example, every quote that I use. Because you know, one of the quotes on the internet is, most of the quotes on the internet are true. George Washington. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So use your intellect, use your reason, be be rigorous and disciplined and intuitive and playful and childlike together in harmony. Leonardo was a master of that. I mean, he was he's incredibly disciplined, logic, logical and detailed in his writings. And he's wildly playful and artistic. Uh, Freud wrote a book about Leonardo. He said the great Leonardo continued to play as a child throughout his adult life, thus baffling his contemporaries. You know, and, and he has been around uh, in all of the popular literature as the guy. I mean, he is one of the most famous thinkers of all time, period. And, uh, you know, there's a reason for that. And, you know, the inventions and the, 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 the art and, the, you know, just he, he touched so many different disciplines, it was ridiculous. And so, you know, for us to be a modern day Leonardo da Vinci means something. That's my mission. I'm telling you, it's why, you know, I wrote the book. It came out in 1998, but it's universal principles. And, you know, he lived at a time of, of great chaos, great uncertainty. Uh, he left uh, Florence. We think of Florence and Tuscany. And, oh, how wonderful. The Medici, the golden age of art. There were huge scandals that led him to leave when he was a young man. He went to Milan, lived there for about 17 years, was driven out by a French invasion, was a refugee, went down to the Vatican, worked for the Pope for a while until the Pope's brother, who was his patron, died. Then they Want him there because his ideas were too outrageous. He went back to Florence. They thought he was too old. Uh, and Michelangelo was the big new rock star in town. Thank God he wound up uh, back uh, uh, in Milan for a while. And then he spent the last three years of his life uh, as the advisor to the King of France. So his life was by no means, he did all this amazing creativity. The Last Supper, uh, the Mona Lisa, uh, his inventions. Uh, his his philosophy, all of this, his anat anatomical drawings, which are still used in medical schools today, 500 years later, he did all this in a time of 
tremendous difficulty, uncertainty, and chaos. We can't even, you know, we still, our world right now is a piece of cake. We're still blessed with unbelievable abundance. We still have all kinds of mechanisms in place that we can leverage to bring out the best in our world. He didn't have any of that. Hmm. None of that. Yet he was able to produce so much uh, masterpiece level work. And so what is it about that uncertainty that, that one, when someone embraces can actually bring out the best in them? Well, you see, that's the thing is, Innovation. Nova means new. But what people forget is that means you have to let go of the old. Well, we're in a time of letting go a lot of a lot of what has been old. Some of some people cherish some of what's been old. Some people cling to it. Some people want something new, but it's a something new that we vehemently disagree with. So what is the something new that we can create together that is creative? that does a better job of meeting the deep needs of more people. You know, it, this is, leadership is about meeting people's needs. It's about understanding, their, empathizing with their feelings, seeing what's going on that's causing their feelings or leading them to have those feelings, the stimulus for those feelings then seeing the needs that are underlying the feelings and figuring out what are they asking for and how can we meet more needs in ways that are creative and positive. Mm. So, right, you know, people are doing the best they can, but their ideas are somewhat limiting and mm. they are sadly tribal. There's, there's still this, this primitive mindset that says there's just – limited resources and they have to be distributed to me not you that you're threatening me by being there and having your needs instead of us thinking how do we take into account more people's needs and do it more elegantly and intelligently without with a problem with politics is everybody has a pre-digested notion of the how you beat those people's needs mm. instead of really we need fresh thinking now about how to meet more people's needs, whoever they voted for. Amen, man. You know, I was just up in um, Massachusetts. I was up at the uh, Kripalu Center teaching. And um, on my way back, my, uh, the guy that was driving me was t you know, showing me the town. And he's like, you know, we used to have you know, iron ore over here. We'd make artillery for the army. And then GE had a plant over here. And, you know, it's all gone. They go, well, what do people do? He's like, yeah, you know, a little tourism here. But pretty much everyone left. And I said, what, you know, what's up with that? He says, it's pretty much all the Northeast. It's pretty much all. And so I'm like sitting there driving through this like rust belt, if you will, that that's way bigger than, than people make it out to be. And sitting there thinking, and, and, and so now the dialogue is, you know, well, it's China's fault. China took all the jobs. And so the question, really, it's a big question, but what, if these jobs mean us manufacturing more stuff that the planet and the landfills can't take, I don't know if that answer is a long-term win answer. So it's, you know, yeah, people need jobs, but what do we need to make? Like, what is the actual solution to an economy that's based on consumption? And how can we get creative to say, okay, hold on a second. We don't need to make more shit. So what, what, is, it, what is it that we actually want this world to look like? And now's a really great time to look at that. Well, that's what again. So we come right back to curiosity. Those are the kind of questions we need in the public forum, mm -hmm. and and getting, you know, the, here's something heartening. I, I I still strongly believe the vast majority of of Americans have fundamentally similar values uh, in terms of respecting human rights, in terms of wanting to to facilitate a world that allows people to, to be successful and to create a better world. This is an optimistic place. It was founded on optimism. It's founded on people who thought, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna leap humanity forward with the notion of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And if you look at the big trend of things, that has been so with all the, you know, with this, I mean, the nightmare of, you know, the civil war, uh, the, the 
overcoming slavery. You know, slavery was the law of the land not that long ago. Women were not allowed to vote not that long ago. In the big picture of our evolution, we are moving in a direction uh, that is in alignment with this shared vision that the geniuses who created uh, this experiment. And we are at a crucial point in this experiment now. So we need to be asking those questions. We need to know how to think creatively. We need to be engaging in dialogue, not just you know, battening down in our positions and, 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 ma and demonizing the other side, whichever side you're on. That's not, it's not gonna help. It's just not gonna help. It's gonna make it worse. Yeah. So look to the needs, look to the fundamental feelings, and then look for new solutions predicated on intelligent questions like the one you just posed. Well, and it's, and it's a big question because it really makes us look at what the hell it is we're doing as a, a species, as you know, beyond uh, you know, an international community and a nation. But you know, what do we actually, you know, we need food, water, shelter, <laughs> you know, some form of fuel. Uh, you know, at that point then, you don't need as much stuff, yet everything is geared towards that. And so, I mean, this is, to me, I see it as a wonderful opportunity to, to look at the fundamentals of what we call our economy and what drives this whole damn thing and say, okay, this is obviously not working for millions and millions of people, and it isn't about you know half the population being wrong and crazy, right? That doesn't that doesn't make any sense. It has to do with the system and and, and needing a dramatic rethink. So we need to balance logic and creativity, as he said. Then where else? Like how would Leonardo walk us through this? What would the next step look like? Yes. Well, the next step is corporalita balance the body and the mind. So we, we mentioned earlier how this is a very important time for self-care, for eating well, for remembering to exercise, for moving, for doing everything you know how to do and learning more. It's great, you're, you're such a wonderful resource uh, for helping people have practices that really work because guess what? The mind and body really can't be separated. No kidding. Leonardo mm -hmm. knew this 500 years ago. So you know his Vitruvian man mm -hmm. uh, that we see everywhere? Well, you see it as a, uh, I saw it recently, it was a, a logo for a yoga studio. <laughs> Healers use it. Uh, uh, nutraceuticals use it. Why? Because you know what was Leonardo was, was saying is that uh, in this, drawing, which was by the, it was a drawing, it was an illustration for his friend's book. And his friend was writing a book about architecture uh, called Divine Proportion. And the idea is that the divine proportions of the human body are the perfect template for building structures, that we are a microcosm of the macrocosm, that we are a symbol of the entire universe. We embody the entire universe. So if you want a harmonious, beautiful universe out there, create a harmonious, beautiful universe in here. Mm. So, I mean, this is, you know, my greatest passion is just learning these practices myself. That's how I got into Aikido. That's how I got into Qigong. That's how I got into Tai Chi, uh, uh, healing. You know, I'm always studying, learning, practicing this every day. And... Now's the time to really practice this. That's it. <laughs> now, now, now is the time to be practicing this. And, and to your point, you know, you want, you know, as above, so below. You want, you want harmony outside. You cannot achieve it without harmony inside. And that's really, I mean, our culture doesn't really speak to that. Our culture, you know, wants, you know, binge watching Netflix. And there's a lot of things that one can do with their time. Uh, that are not necessarily uh, watering the inner garden. And so th there needs to be a, a fundamental kind of rethinking of how we align with ourselves because the pharmaceuticals haven't worked and all that. And so, you know, I, I mean, I, we're preaching to the choir here. A lot of my students, you know, do this yeah. work all the time. You've been doing this for, for a very long time. Look, uh, you know, I stumbled on Tai Chi. Um, I was a scientist 
at the time, I, I remain a scientist. I would not have continued if it didn't give me tremendous value, peace, calm, and clarity, and energy, and all these wonderful things that came from just doing these practices. I was like, you know, damn, <laughs> what is that, right? I mean, it's, it's there, it's been there for 6,000 years, it works, uh, you know, check it out. <laughs> check it out, big time, That's big it. time. So you have to be of sound mind and body, and you have to come from that kind of you know, mental, spiritual, physical health continuum in order to be able to play this game, says Leonardo. And so, yes. and so along that line then, you are balancing the, the intellect with the imagination, you're balancing your inside and your outside, so you're becoming a whole person, really. And then where would he take us you know, to kind of bring this home? He brings us home with the seventh principle, connessione, connessione. Everything connects to everything else. So be a systems thinker. Look at the big picture and the details in harmony. A lot of people get, you know, they're good at seeing the big picture, but they, they lose track of what's in front of them. A lot of other folks are just caught up in what's right in front of them, especially when there's constantly having their urgency, emergency buttons being pushed by the way media is in our world today. That's why, you know, all these things come together. What questions are you asking every day? You want to change the world, change your questions. Think for yourself, dimostrazione. Contemplate beauty on a daily basis. Keep your smile in the face of uncertainty. Recognize that it's an opportunity for something new and creative and positive to come forth. Integrate logic and imagination. Have a practice and practice it every day now more than ever. And then look, creativity is, it's making new connections. It's seeing things you haven't seen before. It's finding new opportunities. So we have a tremendous chance to do this now. And Leonardo is a, a magnificent guy. Wonderful. I'm gonna. Uh, we're gonna go to some studio questions here. I, I, you know, I know your dog's having a having a field day out there. You might want to let someone in. I'll, yeah, I'll gather a couple questions. All good. All good. Um, so yeah, just read the question and then we'll. Um, I'll, I'll phrase it to him. Great. Um, so we have a question from MK. She says, "How do we stay in balance when we try to touch the other side?" And when they're so closed and angry. So probably a really good question for today's political climate. Yeah, yeah um, absolutely. How do we touch the other side um, of our circles? and Or do we just hope that if they're not receptive, it just becomes a, a pebble in their pond or something? Or it creates a ripple, ripple effect? Got it. So to summarize again, how do we... How do we uh, stay in balance when we try balance. to touch the other side? How do we stay... So, so MK is asking, how do we stay in balance when we try to touch the other side? And, and you know, they might have a much, much more kind of aggressive stance and she's trying to you know, bridge across. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Here's the thing. You might lose your center. It's not a question that you won't lose your center. Somebody might really just freak you out and piss you off. The question is, actually, they can't really freak you out and piss you off. They can only be a stimulus. You're in charge of your response. So if you first of all get that idea, you're in charge of your response. They can do stuff you don't, you know, you choose uh, to respond to in a particular way, but get that you're in charge of how you respond. And you may not be happy with the way you respond because people, you know, we use that language, people say, it presses my buttons. You might lose it. How fast can you get it back? So don't you, don't, you're not going to, I know this is the urban monk, but don't expect to be a fully realized monk uh, uh, in dealing with conflict and difficulty. But if you just have that question alive, and if you're practicing, every, see, you have to practice every day. You have to do something. Do your Qigong, do your, your Tai Chi, do your meditation, go to Aikido class, have, uh, go to your yoga class. Uh, just do something that's nurturing that alignment around the still center every single day so that you can get back to that faster. And a lot of this is physiological. If you have a little smile, you won't freak out as much. If you keep your eyes soft, you're changing the physiology, you're changing the biochemistry in the moment. If you get make your posture upright, 
<sighs> breathe all the way into your, your belly, you're shifting out of that stress fight flight response and you're making your physiology more conducive to supporting a more empathic response. And, and remember, the key to this is, not, you know, I'm not saying you have to like what somebody says that sounds really aggressive, but if you can keep your center, you might be able to see the fear and the pain that's driving that person's aggression, because I'll tell you that's what it is. Yeah. It's, not, it's hard to see. It, take, it takes profound inner strength that we all have to cultivate to be able to see that when it's right in your face. But if, if you can begin to look for it, if you can begin to be, and, and by the way, being empathic, here's the thing people miss. If I understand you fully, I get where you're coming from. It doesn't mean I have to agree with you. Right. Right. Uh, you know, listen, check this out. Uh, uh, when things go wrong, you don't have to go with them. Hmm. Guess who that's a quote from? This may be one of those wacky wrong quotes on the internet. <laughs> who said it? Elvis! <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. So, so, yeah, so get that you're responsible for how you feel. Uh, people can do stuff as a stimulus, but you're responsible for your, for your reaction. That's what responsible means. You're responsible. So find your center, look for the feelings and the needs, and then see if there's some way to figure out a creative response. Rinse it, and by the way, don't just do this with the, you know, the, the person who's in your face from the opposite point of view as, of, as you. Try this with your kids. Yeah. <laughs> you know, try this with your spouse. Try this with your boss. Try this with your colleague who you have a little conflict with. Because when we have these big conflicts, it's really hard to, to practice this. You gotta practice this every day. Uh, you know, I recommend uh, uh, the work of Marshall Rosenberg, Nonviolent Communication, more important now than ever before. It's, it's, I'm writing about, I'm trying to make it uh, accessible to people. I'm writing about that in my new book. Uh, and it suddenly became way more relevant. Yeah. You know, there's this quote that says, the only thing I can't tolerate is intolerance. What, what, would, you, what would you say to that? Because that's where a lot, I think a lot of people uh, on the liberal side are, you know, so a lot of people are like, okay, it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. And then like John Oliver came out last night and just like, you know, went at it again. And it's just like, you know, no, these are hard lines that we, you know, these are battle lines because we fought too hard for this. And so what would be the Da Vinci way of kind of looking at, at, at this type of polarity? Well, you know, I mean, I, there are times when you do have to fight and then sort it all out later. I mean, I, I can't, you know, if somebody's breaking into your house uh, and trying to kill you, uh, there may not be time to, you know, consider, you know, it's like my old, my Kung Fu teacher, we used to play this game called Mugger's Alley. And we'd set up these various mugging situations and, when it was your turn, you'd, you'd have to be the citizen walking along and the muggers would jump out and get you. And you had to try to use your self-defense skills uh, uh, to defeat them. And usually you died. Hmm. Uh, now, the teacher was really good. So one time I was the mugger and he, he, you know, he smashed me into the ground and he used to love to like, pretend he was handcuffing you. So he'd sit on, on, he was sitting on my back, my face is smashed into the ground and he's handcuffing me. And he says, why were you mugging me? And I said to him, because of my deprived socioeconomic background. <laughs> that made him laugh enough that I was able to escape. <laughs> I, I saw a meme uh, yesterday that I loved, I loved, I loved. And uh, the, the master was uh, working with a student and the student says, uh, you know, Sifu, you, you keep talking about peace and nonviolence. You're, you're teaching us how to, to fight. How do you reconcile those? And uh, his answer was, it's better to be a warrior in the garden than a gardener in a war, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, it's really about the preparedness and the willingness to stand, stand your ground and hold a line, but really understanding that, you know, no one wants that. 
No one wants that. Everyone wants peace. But, you know, yeah, to your point, there, there are places where, you know, you do have to hold the line. And, um, you know, there, there has been, I mean, look, the Nazis did do their thing, right? There has been a history of things kind of coming and going. And so, again, we're in very interesting times. And, um, you know, I, for one, feel like America has a really good opportunity to grow through this and come together, but you can't come together in the same broken system, right? It's time to have a creative uh, rethinking of the whole thing and how we do what we do is what I'm hearing here as well. Yeah, yeah and, and, and part of how we got to this place is a lack of this kind of empathy, a dismissing of a lot of people's, you know, there's a, yeah, there's, there's a dangerous extreme, which if given free reign, uh, would would be, and we've seen this in history plenty of times, and it, it's not a pretty sight, and we have to be vigilant about that. In the meantime, we need to look for common ground with the majority of people who are still decent people who share fundamental values. And I'm not saying that's easy, but that's what that's what the greatest leaders have always done. And leaders don't have to be form, you know, especially in the world today, they don't have to be formally anointed by a system, whether it's you know, a political system. Uh, they can arrive, we have the opportunity for people to arise as leaders in their community. And you start by leading in terms of just how you are treating people every day. You know, if you think you're going to make the world a better place uh, by going and burning down something that is a symbol of the other side, that I'll tell you is not going to make the world a better place. Think again. Yeah. Make, that's going to make it worse. And the first principle is don't make it worse. Yeah. Don't make it worse. Yeah. And, and you said something in there that that's just so uh, powerful in that, you know, it is on every single one of us to step in and make the world a better place in ourselves and in the world around us. And that's really... I think the call to action here is this is this is the beating of a drum that is not the external war but the internal war. It's like what what is this whole thing about? And how do I re-examine this whole thing called life? You know, why am I working so hard to spend my money on things I don't use? Why, you know, why, 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 right? And so if we could go and unpack what, what you know, Leonardo said about this, you, know, you have to sit with it. You have to be curious. You have to look at it with creativity and logic. And I just, I love having a framework for this. And I think that this has been a very helpful conversation. Um, any, uh, so, so when is this book, the, the book that you are writing right now uh, comes out when? It'll be out in September, okay. September of 2017. I'm going to hand it in on January 7th. Uh, New World Library is my publisher. They did a, a previous book called Brain Power, Improve Your Mind as You Age, which I wrote to celebrate my 60th birthday. <laughs> nice. That was four years ago. Do you remember what's and, in it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, part of what's in it is your brain is designed to improve with use. And the only question is, what's the best way to improve it? Mm. And it turns out, like, I'm, you know, my memory is getting sharper. Uh, Marshally, I would rather, uh, it would be easier to have messed with me 20 years ago than it would be to mess with me now. Uh, so, you know, my intention is get stronger, get clearer, get more centered, be more resourceful, and empower myself to be of more service to others. Uh, you know, because that, you know, you learn and it, that is the secret of happiness is is connecting with other people, caring for other people, enriching their lives. Uh, th this this is the, you know, you want the secret of life. That's the secret of life. Uh, care, connect with your inner self, connect with others, think creatively about how to make the world a better place and apply the seven Da Vinci principles. Love it. Love it. Michael, I, I love your work. I love what you're doing and the stance that you've taken here. Um, and it's nice. I mean, we need framework. We need a better filter through which to uh, digest reality in a world that's so chaotic. And so, you know, without these types of filtration mechanisms, it's really easy to say, you know, the sky is falling and, and wait for someone to fix it. But, um, you know, we need tools and this is a powerful tool. How can people find you? 
michaelgelb.com. It's G-E-L-B, michaelgelb.com. Beautiful. Man, I want to thank you for your time. This has been great. Um, you know, one of these days we'll get to hang out in uh, New York area. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot more to come on this uh, prosperity project. I think, uh, you, you know, you've got a, a very strong voice in this. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to working with you on that as well. Thank you so much. My pleasure. This has been great. Thank you. So thanks for being here. Uh, this has been live. Obviously, we've taken a few questions uh, from our audience on Facebook. Let me know what you think. Uh, I'm going to be actually going live uh, in what, about half an hour? About half an hour going live again with another guest. Uh, usually we don't do two a day, but it's just the way things stacked up this week. Uh, so if you're around, stick around. I'll be back in a uh, half an hour on this same you know, Facebook page. And uh, let me know what you think, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.